Welcome to the April 4th Pinellas Board Meeting. Please stand for the invocation given by Council Member Albritton, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, first we want to thank you for your blessings and for the privilege meeting here today. We come together seeking your guidance in these deliberations. Please give us the wisdom and strength to make decisions in the best interest of the people who live and work in our communities. We ask for protection for all of the men and women who put themselves in harm's way for the good of those who they serve. We humbly ask for these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Not good. There. <laughs> All right. Uh, next, we're going to go around the board and introduce yourself and, and, and uh, your titles. Let's start over here with Brian. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Brian Scott, uh, County Commission, District 2 at large. Hi, I'm Vice Mayor Patty Reed for the awesome city of Pinellas Park. It is awesome. <laughs> Chris Burke, Councilor, City of Seminole, representing the inland communities. Jared Buckman, council member, city of Oldsmar, representing Safety Harbor, Tarpon Springs, and Oldsmar. Gina Driscoll, city of St. Petersburg, representing PSTA. Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commission. Dave Albritton, city of Clearwater, council member. Good afternoon, Whit Blanton, executive director. And I'm Michael Smith, uh, commissioner, city of Largo, and vice chair for Pinellas. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we're gonna move on to citizens to be heard. Tina, do, are there any citizens wishing to be heard? on the agenda today outside of action? Yes, sir, we have three citizens asking to be heard and I also have um, an email from Commissioner Coolius of Tarpon Springs to be read into the record as well. The first citizen to be heard is Mr. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. Right. Hi, Hi, sir, you'll have three minutes to speak to the board, welcome. Thank you, sir, David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live at 802 Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. This board, as a political body, I ask you what is meant in your perspective, uh, what is meant in regards to affordable housing? Is affordable housing, in pertinent part, a structuring used to accommodate a political entity of such, a political entity in need of shelter of its own? Did the redistricting in Tallahassee last year give the county housing of its own choice? In a sense, as an entity of government, is the redistricting of the county seen as an affordable way to build an edifice for municipal and city jurisdictions, shape-shifting the government from a county land-based operation into a water jurisdiction that's looking for an affordable house. As a political body, as an entity of such, looking for shelter, does the county and its municipalities find the jurisdiction of the 14th Amendment an affordable way to house itself? I have a diagram here depicting a sequence of events where the county has already been sold to the water district in both resolution and ordinance, seen as a fee simple 30 year transfer of function and power um, in these statutes here, also seen as a transfer of function and power in home rule charter section 2.04 Q. Now, once the county is embodied within the water district of such, they're hoping to be born as 14th Amendment water jurisdictions. Now this housing of such, this jurisdictionalism that's taking place under the 14th Amendment, giving such body politic a house 
as due process, me as a civilian, as a resident, I lose liberty, property, and such. So in light of giving this body politic a, a house of such, an edifice, a structuring, thereby I lose my home as a result thereof. I stand against uh, such affordable housing of such in uh, such context, and um, I'm here to stand against such uh, uh, political waylays. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. The next citizen to be heard is Sharon Calvert. Hey, ma'am, you have three minutes to speak. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Sharon Calvert. I live in Tierra Verde. I tried to reach out to, to Ford Pinellas, but I was unable to get my request. So I would like a, this is my request for a copy of the project description and information related to the 34th Street South and Pinellas Bayway South repaving projects that are included in your planning documents. Ford Pinellas requested FDOT to do a road diet elimination of two general vehicle lanes for two bus lanes for PSTA's Route 90. PSTA's ridership on that route has declined over 18% and is less than 1,600 riders. There are more new apartments built over the last couple of years with big parking garages than bus riders. And the number of new fast food resident, uh, restaurants with drive throughs continue to be built in that quarter. It is unreasonable to be spending taxpayer dollars to remove general lanes of vehicle traffic for a bus route with less than 1,600 riders. Therefore, I ask you to please resend your request to FDOT for any lane elimination on 34th Street South. Regarding the Bayway South project, the Bayway is the gateway to world-class Fort DeSoto, its RV park, and the largest boat ramp in the county. But I'm wondering if Ford Pinellas knew what was actually being designed regarding the part of that project to connect two ends of the multi-use trail. It is not a multi-use trail or a shared-use path. It is a bi-directional bike path called a cycle track in the road on the northbound side of the bayway that has almost 30 crossings within one mile. The width of those lanes on the northbound side have been reduced, are being reduced to two feet, to 11, by, by two feet to 11 feet, while the southbound lanes remain 12 feet with a single southbound bike lane. With safety as one of your priorities, this project is going to create a hazardous danger zone for everyone using the Bayway, and especially for the residents in Tierra Verde. A vehicle leaving one of the crossings on the northbound side has to look both ways at the sidewalk, then inch forward, look both ways at the bi-directional bike, bike lanes, then inch over those bike lanes and look again north for the northbound vehicles, and then pull out into two lanes of traffic, northbound traffic. FDOT is aware of our concerns and valid concerns issues that have been raised uh, from Terra Verde and, and, and the residents. Um, Terra Verde was never informed of anything called a cycle track. The Terra Verde Community Association, of which I am a board member, um, are working with them. Um, however, uh, we have requested FDOT to make the bike lanes remain one direction on both sides of the bayway because bi-directional bike lanes should not be used when there's almost 30 crossings. That's not limited access, and especially when the speed limit is over 30 miles per hour. Thank so you. I ask that you please help us in this issue, working with FDOT to make sure that everyone in Tierra Verde and uses the Bayway is safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next up, Commissioner Smith, is Ms. Angela Sweet. Howdy. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. You can, um, well, good afternoon. Thank you so much. It's an honor to stand before you, Forward Pinellas. We love you. 
Um, I'm, I'm just here to, talk, to share with you some concerns. And um, uh, uh, because I'm blind, I have an iPhone that was going to um, uh, read the email that I sent to you. And I pray that you would uh, take action on. Thank you. Swipe up. We acknowledge the God. These words spoke to my community and gave to my esteemed colleagues advocating for environmental justice for all, particularly in the county district of Pinellas and in the city of St. Petersburg, Florida, notorious for its failure factory schools. The horrific incident of the arrest that changed my life occurred on Monday, April 10th, 2023. The Safe Policing for Safe Communities Executive Order signed into law by our 45th President Trump evidently had no bearing on SPPD negligence in aligning law, enforcement, policies, and practice with divine order. Our national constitutional laws and amendments trump states' rights adjudicating Jim Crow laws, exclusion, left up to the interpreter, to appease segregationists intricately woven into the fabric of Florida state statutes, ordinances, and laws in defense of anarchy, confederacy, in hindsight, lives on, consequences of a governing authority such as the city of St. Petersburg, and its tyrannical military-style police brigade, terrorizing the least suspecting vagrant, imposing, stringent punishment without remorse, violation of adults with disabilities and civil rights acts prohibiting discrimination while constructively interpreting and enforcing the law resulting in anarchy this breach of public trust in defiance of constitutional law a seditious act of treason punishable by the fullest extent of the law swipe up or down to select a custom act a society that lacks recent messages info at forward pinellas lucinda doc lowry okay. solomon gleamed at eckerd uh, ed lowry uh, solomon uh, lucinda doc granted info at forward pinellas dot org i'm sorry i i i, I mishandled my phone I have to send you, send you the email. Thank you so much for your time anyway. Absolutely. We all, we all got a copy of your email, so we'll read over it. And oh, okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Appreciate you. Okay. Commissioner Smith, we now have Commissioner Mike Eisner from the city of Tarpon Springs also wishing to speak under citizens to be heard. Sure. Absolutely. Sir, you have three minutes. Welcome again. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm Commissioner Mike Eisner from Tarpon Springs. Thank you all for hearing me. I'm a little bit dilapidated today, but uh, <clears throat> nobody affected my mouth, so I'm able to speak. Um, the mayor couldn't make it today, so I want to apologize, and a few of the other commissioners who all wanted to be here, but you've received the um, letter that he wrote and I was here for the past meeting, and I didn't get to speak at the last meeting, and that was a blessing for you all that I didn't. Um, I'm the guy that he said might not be as kind as he is, and I will be kind today. Um, what I wanted to explain to you was everything that we spoke about was the facts and figures of why we need to be a vote on this and a seat is because we're, we're a large a large group we have enough people to warrant it um, some of the reasons that I <clears throat> listened to when I was here about an even vote we voted on an even vote um, and when an even vote happens I mean th that that should not have been a decision I also felt <clears throat> knowing Vice Mayor Buckman Hey, he has enough work just handling his end. There's no way, and it's not fair to him, uh, to have to represent Safety Harbor, uh, Oldsmar, and Tarpon Springs. Um, 
I, I, just having us on a vote doesn't mean that it's going to change the way Forward Pinellas handles things. Um, I believe that uh, we would make a positive influence and give you a different perspective. Nobody knows our town better than we do. Um, we are the northernmost uh, location of Pinellas County. We border, uh, you know, Pasco County. So <clears throat> the bottom line is for me, I really think that we should um, have another look at this. Um, it shouldn't be something where we're just, you know, having to go through uh, a, a second person. So that's mainly what I'm here for, and I just wanted you to know that we're all strongly in the same agreement that we should have a seat and that you would be kind enough to uh, at least take another vote on it and uh, see that we can be a part and help out and, and make all of Pinellas County better. Um, there is another um, letter from another commissioner who also couldn't make it here. We had a meeting late last night. I'm the only one that seems to be able to get up in the morning, so uh, I'm here. But uh, bottom line is we really would look to see that we can have a, a, a voice in the matter. So thank you for your consideration. Appreciate it. Thank you, it. sir. Commissioner Smith, if you'll allow me, I'm going to read in the comments that were submitted this afternoon by Commissioner Coolius from the city of Tarpon Springs. Go ahead. Dear board, thank you for the opportunity to speak on the issue of Tarpon Springs having their own seat at the table at Forward Pinellas. If reappointment of seats or the consideration happens every nine to 10 years, it is important Tarpon Springs and its representatives give it all we must gain a seat. Mr. Blanton, I ask in the kindest way that when it is your time to speak, please support Tarpon Springs to have our own seat. You have the most powerful voice on this board and I truly believe your comments can heavily influence the board in the direction you may prefer it to go. I felt at the last meeting your opinion may have steered away a yes vote for the Tarpon Springs, but nether nevertheless, a seven to five vote was encouraging. Please, as a city representative, I am trying to win the hearts and minds of the board members for Tarpon Springs to have our own seat. I want to present some new and old facts regarding the many reasons the city of Tarpon Springs should have our own seat at the table and Pinellas County's unique data makes us an anomaly than all counties in the state of Florida. Tarpon Springs is a full service city, is a gateway city landlocked by another county, beach community. Please remember all the facts I had mentioned before at the previous meeting about why we should have a seat. Pinellas County has the second to smallest amount of land area of all Florida counties at 274 square miles. This is an outlier along with the county union from the data provided. Has the highest population per square mile than any county in the state of Florida at 3,551 people per square mile. This is another outlier. Please look at the data regarding the closest counties with the highest population density per square mile and you will agree we Pinellas County are unique and different. There are other counties in Florida who have more MPO seats than municipalities in the state and their decision to produce those seats is based on Florida Statute 339.175 Metropolitan Planning Organization. The two outliers I have presented is more than enough to justify not only Tarpon Springs having their own seat, but possibly other municipalities in Pinellas as well. Our county, Pinellas County, is so unique in how we are positioned for traffic flow up and down the west coast plus the density and small land area space we have that we together as county must unite in making sure representation of all cities and their positions in the county in this crucial time in Florida's population expansion is made. We as a county have a 53% representation of MPO seats to municipalities while others have 70% representation and some counties have over 100% based on MPO seats and number of municipalities in their counties. These two outliers alone justify the need to have ex expansion for Forward Pinellas in ways other counties cannot. I am worried that if Tarpon Springs can only, re can only represent themselves three years out of nine, then our voices for transportation won't be heard. The statutes mentioned above allow, us, allow for us as a county to expand with these outliers mentioned playing the most important role. No one can deny the fact that our county has data that warrants the ability for expansion of more seats at Forward Pinellas. 
Please, I am begging this board to look at this county to allow the expansion of another seat because we have a small land area as a county, but together we are one of the strongest in uniting a common cause for the unprecedented amount of population growth that is coming to Pinellas County. I sincerely thank you all for this consideration, Commissioner Coolius. Thank you very much. Are there anybody else need, wanting to be heard? There are no additional citizens to be heard. All right, we're gonna move on. Uh, next, we're gonna handle the consent I, uh, agenda. Do any board members wish to pull any of the items from the consent to be handled individually? Not hearing, uh, I'll need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move approval. Second. Nice. I have a motion and who is the second? Second. All right. Uh, I have a motion to second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All oppose. Item passes. All right. Now we're going to move on to presentations. Uh, first up is 5A PST activity report given by Council Member Driscoll. Thank you. The PSTA board met last on March 29th, 2023. Um, during the public comment period, PSTA received um, a, a quick presentation and request from multiple USF students, one of whom is a disabled veteran, to implement a pilot program for free bus passes for veterans. PSTA staff has been evaluating this and plans to present a recommendation at the, upcom the upcoming planning committee meeting. Um, as far as information items, Ron Pierce with RSA Consulting gave an update on the Florida Legislature bill regarding HART. He noted that the bill no longer includes language about a merger with PSTA, but a possibility of another MOU for collaboration as we've had in the past. Um, Brad Miller provided a summary of a recent legislative trip to Washington, D.C. that he um, took part in along with Commissioners Siraki and Robinson earlier in March where they discussed funding for public transportation with various legislators. PSTA's next board meeting will be held on April 26th at 9 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board for Commissioner Dris or Council Member Driscoll? All right, we're gonna move on to the next one, item 5B, regional activity report given by the executive director. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'll keep this one brief because we have some other items on the agenda that relate to this. Uh, I did want to let everybody know that we have uh, just issued a notice to proceed for the Regional Transportation Needs Assessment, which is being conducted through the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance, which is the collaboration of the uh, six MPOs in the Tampa Bay, West Central Florida area. Uh, that group is operating under the premise of the old Chairs Coordinating Committee, which is in state statutes, at least for now. Uh, there has been a bill filed that would remove that from state statutes. Um, but the SCTPA has an interlocal agreement, and with, whether it's in or out of the state statutes, we'll continue to collaborate. Uh, these MPOs include Polk, Citrus Hernando, Sarasota Manatee, and then the three core MPOs here in the, in the Pasco Pinellas Hillsborough area. That regional needs assessment will be complete uh, sometime later this year, right, Chelsea, um, or early next year. And it will lead the um, foundation for the development of the county-based long-range transportation plans, which are also underway. So I wanted to assure you that there is a process for evaluating regional transportation that exists today. Uh, it will be technically driven. Uh, it'll also be uh, providing qualitative input. Uh, there'll be opportunities for public uh, input to weigh in. And that will um, kind of be the foundation, as I mentioned, for each individual long-range plan. In addition, the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance is working together to establish shared performance measures that are required by the Federal Highway Administration for the performance of the transportation network. And right now, we're talking about uh, PM2, which deals with pavement conditions. So we have to address those as well. Chelsea's going to cover that at your next meeting because we have to adopt those uh, in May. Uh, but I did want to let you know that that is based in collaboration among all the MPOs staff working together so that there's consistency, uh, not only in our, our needs that are identified, but also in the performance measures for transportation. And I'm happy to take any other questions you might have. Any questions or comments from the board? All right, not seeing any, we'll move on, thank you. All right, moving on to 5C, uh, proposed countywide planned amendments.
Welcome, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Jared Austin. I'm a principal planner here with Ford Pinellas. Uh, and for the past year and some change or so, I've been the primary uh, point person for our agency um, on all things related to the Target Employment and Industrial Land Study, or TEAL study, um, as we call it. And this process started um, back in early 2022 and really throughout the lifetime of that project. Um, we had a number of really key stakeholders involved um, in the work that we did. We reached out to um, the, the business community. We heard from our manufacturing sector. We heard from our, our planners and our economic development staff from around the county, as well as community members and elected officials, um, such as yourselves, who were, who were very much involved in that process. Um, however, in coming into 2023, when we actually adopted the report findings, we did have some um, New board members come on, and many of the elected officials that were involved in that 2022 process were largely from um, our past board makeup. And so before I really got into the presentation today, I just thought it was important just to provide some general context as to why the Target Employment and Industrial Land Study um, was updated in 2022 and some of the logic behind that. Um, as many of you know, um, Pinellas County is what we often refer to as a redeveloping county. Um, that's a very fancy way of saying that we don't have a lot of land countywide for new development. And that land that we do have um, set aside specifically for target employment purposes is really critical to the continued economic vitality of our county, especially being the second largest manufacturer in the state. Um, and so given that, um, and the fact that we had some legislation that came out of the state legislature, namely House Bill 1339 and Senate Bill 962, which allowed for the development of residential on employment and industrial land, which had previously not been allowed for. Um, all of this sort of culminated into the need for us to really reflect on um, some of the TEALS work that was done in the past um, and where we need to head moving forward, um, given these factors and given the fact that the nature of work has changed a lot since 2008. Now, one thing I want to mention before I dive into this, um, in your all's packets, we included updates to Articles 2, 6, and 8 of the countywide rules. And upon further review, we realized that it didn't have the strike through and underline text of what specifically is changing in those sections. Um, because if you just look at all of those sections as a whole, it does seem like quite a bit of information when it's really just certain specific sections. And so after this meeting today, we're going to send out that so that it's more clear what exactly is changing in those sections as it relates to the adopted TEALS report. <clears throat> so again, just as an overview, as I had mentioned, um, this is uh, the TEALS study that we're doing currently is really piggybacking off of previous work that was done in the past, namely with the 2008 TEALS study. And that work was kind of piggybacking off of, at the time, the Pinellas um, by design work, which was seeking to determine how we could continue to retain economic growth for the county in the future. Um, fast forward to 2008, when the Teal study was adopted, we were obviously in the midst of an economic recession. And a lot of the thought process at the time was, you know, how do we take these employment and industrial lands that we have currently and kind of you know, hold on to them, um, uh, those, those lands that are either vacant and appropriate to be developed for um, target employment or are currently developed for target employment, and just hold on to them um, so that when the economy picked back up again, we would have that land available for those target employers. Um, there was, and that's really what led to the formation of these, what we call target employment centers. These are these purple areas you see on the map. Um, again, which represent a lot of that employment and industrial land throughout the county. Um, now, since 2008, we've also had a lot of time to reflect on the, the target employment centers, how they're structured, and some of the incentives that we provided um, back in 2008 for target employment looking to locate within these areas. Um, and we have realized that there are some challenges. You know, we heard loud and clear, um, and it's, you know, no surprise that it, the legislation came through the way it did, that a lot of the way we approach these target employment centers is a bit too restrictive in the sense that it also doesn't account for the fact that the nature of work has changed. Target employment throughout Pinellas County is not just manufacturing and industrial space, but it's also Class A office. And so the types of uses that folks in the Class A office environments 
um, want to want to be located and conglomerated with is different than those in the more traditional industrial and manufacturing. Secondly, it also had a very one-size-fits-all approach. So it kind of took land that was, say, in Tarpon Springs or Oldsmar or Clearwater and treated it the same as what we might have in Central Gateway or in the Warehouse Arts District in St. Petersburg. And so we needed to reflect a little bit more on how we wanted um, to define the typologies of these target employment centers so that they were more reflective of the employment that's actually there today. So fast forward to the 2023 adoption of the Target Employment Industrial Land Study. We wanted to identify key subcategories um, throughout Pinellas County within the target employment centers that are existing today and where they might be appropriate to be expanded that addressed the target employment needs of what is actually present in Pinellas County currently. Specifically, we wanted to move away from that one-size-fits-all approach. We wanted to clearly identify what areas are thriving, why they're thriving the way they are, and how they could be improved in the future, as well as increase the flexibility associated with each of these target employment centers so that they can better fit the needs um, of the uh, target employers um, that we have that may be more in that Class A office environment versus that traditional manufacturing environment. And when I talk about these subcategories, what I'm referencing more specifically are these four subcategories that you see here on your screen. Uh, the first one being Target Employment Center Urban. Think downtown Clearwater, downtown St. Petersburg. These are areas that are really more appropriate for that Class A office environment. They can tend to be more dense, vertically integrated. They want greater walkability, and they want that commercial, retail, and residential flexibility within um, the environments they live, work, and play in. Similarly, the TEC suburb or Target Employment Center suburban office category, again, more Class A office oriented, but a little bit less vertically integrated, more horizontal in nature. Again, they still want that commercial, retail, and residential flexibility um, so that their workers have things to do, um, you know, on break, after work, and what have you. Um, and a prime example of that would be that Jable property, which I included a, a screenshot of there. We also have the Target Employment Center Suburban Industrial category. This is what we think of when we think of that more traditional industrial manufacturing space. Think Central Gateway, think Hercules Industrial Park, think Oldsmar. Um, areas that have really benefited from the Pinellas County Economic Development Employee Sites Program so that they can continue to remain here in our county and expand even. And then finally, we have the Target Employment Center Local category. This is an area where we wanna allow the greatest flexibility um, within the TECs, because when we think of these areas, think of Warehouse Arts District in St. Petersburg. They have the industrial space, the warehouse space, but it's primarily being used for glass blowers, uh, sculpture makers, things that are not what we typically think of when we think of target employment center or target employment uses. And so we want to allow those areas to continue to thrive um, and not be subject, subject to some of the restrictions that have been in place in the past. Additionally, what we also heard loud and clear throughout the TEAL study was that we needed to give better local guidance to our various local partners um, in terms of when they do want to use the Senate Bill 962 or House Bill 1339 measures because they're uh, themselves facing a lot of pressure uh, to meet that affordable housing demand. They needed guidance from us as to where would be most appropriate to do that. And we feel that given the work that's gone into identifying these target employment centers, and even expanding them in some cases, those employment and industrial parcels that are outside of those TECs, we would find more appropriate um, for the, uh, that legislation to be taken advantage of. And for those reasons, we'll be having a much more hands-off approach than we had in the past um, for those employment and industrial uh, uses. Um, so just a quick uh, overview before I delve into some of the incentive structures that we're thinking that would be associated with each of these subcategories. I do just want to provide a brief overview of what's called floor area ratio or sometimes referred to as intensity when we talk about density and intensity standards. And what this illustration is just showing, um, if you look on the far left, you have a development if it took up 100% of the lot that it sits on at a floor area ratio of 1.0, it could build up one story. That same development only took up 50% of the lot that it sits on at a floor area ratio of 1.0, it could go up two stories. And finally, if it took up a quarter of the lot that it sits on at a floor area ratio of 1.0, it could go up four stories. And again, just giving that overview, 
because when we talk, start talking about some of the incentive structures, um, intensity bonuses that we want to offer each of these categories, um, that will play a factor. So for Target Employment Center Urban, we're looking at um, rolling over the 100% intensity bonus for office and research and development uses as we had had um, under the Target Employment Centers of old. Um, however, we would be upping the maximum floor area ratio for the TEC Urban category to an 8.0. And furthermore, for properties 15,000 square feet or greater, Class A office would not count towards that maximum allowable FAR. So, Say you had a developer who wanted to do, say, three stories of office within a TEC urban and then some amount of residential above that, we would not start counting towards that 8.0 until we hit the residential portion. Here we would allow commercial, retail, and residential flexibility as long as it's done concurrently with target employment uses. And then down there at the bottom, you just see some of the associated target employment categories for this uh, TEC. We have TEC Suburban Office, again, carrying over that 100% intensity bonus, this time for manufacturing office and uh, research and development uses. Here we would allow a maximum FAR of a 5.0, and for properties 25,000 square feet or greater, um, Class A office would not count towards that maximum allowable FAR. And here we have commercial, retail, and residential flexibility, again, as long as it's done concurrently with target employment uses. We have Target Employment Center Suburban Industrial, again, rolling over that 100% intensity bonus um, for those target employment uses. We would allow a maximum floor area ratio of a 3.0, and for properties 25,000 square feet or greater, industrial and manufacturing flex space would not count towards that maximum allowable FAR. Given the uh, heavy manufacturing and industrial component to the TEC Suburban Industrial category, Really, the only flexibility we would be looking to add here is commercial flexibility, again, as long as it's done with those uh, concurrently with those target employment uses. And then down at the bottom, again, you can see the associated target employment categories. Finally, we have the target employment center local category. Um, here, a lot of the incentive structure, the allowable uses would be set by the local government. Um, again, we would just require some special, uh, special area plan um, that would help guide um, the growth and redevelopment of this, these areas, um, just so that we're not having arbitrary con conversions of industrial and employment uses that, again, are not tied back to some broader vision of the area. Um, here you can see a bulleted list um, of just some of what we would be looking for. It's not meant to be in, uh, intense uh, for the local governments to meet this, um, but we just want to have that clear criteria established. Now. Um, in addition to how we would treat some of these areas, we do understand that there are some uh, identified target employment centers that would fall under the TEC local category that necessarily don't want that flexibility. They just want to continue operating as um, the target employment center that they currently have. Um, and so basically the TEC local category, if a special area plan was not adopted, um, would just uh, allow the 100% intensity bonus for the manufacturing office um, and uh, research and development uses, which we already allow um, within the, the TEC category more broadly. Um, just some minor items I wanted to touch on too before I wrap up here and take any questions. Um, some other items that are gonna be updated, definitions of target employment, target industry, average wage. I know it sounds super basic, but it is things we've been challenged on in the past, so we wanna make sure we're as clear as possible in defining these terms. And then finally, um, any of the NAICS codes that are associated with those target industry clusters I mentioned earlier, business services, financial services, and so on, those will be incorporated in our countywide plan appendix so that we can be as clear as possible with potential developers as to what we mean by these specific target industries. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions or discussions. And again, this is just an informational item today. There's no action required. Thank you, sir. Uh, open it to the board. Any members have questions or comments? Yes, Commissioner. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Smith. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, quick question. Um, the, if I'm reading this right, it said that there were 13,000 acres identified in the 2008 study. Mm -hmm. um, with these additions of these four subcategories, what, what does that increase to? So we don't have an exact number, or I don't have an exact number for you today. I should actually specify this map that's identified here is just for visualization purposes of kind of how the subcategories would work. But those specific boundaries you see picked up, say around here, 
any areas that are expanded or picked up, that has to be identified by the local governments and then submitted to us through our process. So we're still fleshing that out, we're meeting with them, it still would have to come through their process at a local level um, before we would, we would have those new um, target employment centers established, and in terms, the, and as well as the associated acreage. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner Scott. Any other members? All right, thank you so much. <clears throat> if you. I could just add one yes. thing. So the, we're gonna bring this back to you for action, uh, most likely at your July meeting. And that'll give you time to, to think this over, get any feedback from your staff that you think is appropriate, any questions that you have there. And then um, because we've canceled the June meeting, it'll be on the July meeting. We do have some other countywide plan uh, information that we're going to be bringing back for action, other cleanup activities, and we'll introduce that at your May meeting. All right, thank you. All right, moving on to item 5D, uh, Vantage Pinellas Housing Action Plan Resolution. I'm just gonna take this one from right here. Uh, board members, um, I think it's um, really good news that we've been working uh, in such close partnership with Pinellas County Housing and Community Development Department and with um, some of our other cities that receive housing assistance to put together a housing compact uh, that has been endorsed by all those local governments plus a few additional local governments that just believe uh, that they wanna be part of, of any strategy to address affordable housing in our county. Uh, we also are in the process of developing a housing action plan, and that housing action plan will be presented at our April 28th uh, housing summit, uh, which is being held at the Largo Cultural Center uh, from 9 to 3.30. And I wanted to let you all know that Carol Strickland is here today. She's the director of the Housing and Community Development Department for Pinellas County. And we've been very, working very closely with them uh, to develop this resolution that designates the Ford Pinellas Board uh, as the forum or convener uh, or facilitator, if you will, for our efforts countywide in um, reaching the goal that the Housing Compact has identified for 10,000 uh, units that are affordable over the next 10 years. And that's gonna come in all shapes and sizes and it's gonna be, um, working with the local governments to make sure that those strategies uh, fit their needs and, and their uh, context. Nothing is being mandated for any of the local governments that are part of this housing action plan or housing compact, but we are producing common definitions, we are creating a, um, a toolbox and providing technical assistance and looking at other uh, techniques like incentives and uh, other ways to encourage the facilitation of affordable housing. The county administration and the Board of County Commissioners um, feel like our board is best suited to be that forum because we do touch all 25 local governments and have the countywide plan that Jared just talked about as our uh, guiding uh, um, legal back backdrop for how we make land use decisions. And from an MPO standpoint, I'm a big believer that transportation and housing policy are, are very much interrelated. So the Board uh, of Commissioners, uh, uh, as the county, um, countywide uh, authority, took action yesterday to adopt this resolution. We're asking you to adopt this resolution today, and then we will move on to the other partner local governments to also adopt the resolution. And I'll be happy to answer any questions, and Carol's here who can answer questions as well. Thank you. I'd like to open it up to the board for any questions. Not seeing anything, I'll close it. Uh, Tina, do we have any citizens that would like to be uh, speak on this subject, this item? No, sir, we do not. All right, pull it back. On this item, we'll need uh, um, uh, action. Uh, does a board member wish to make a motion? Move, move to approve. I have a motion. Second. And a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, passes. Uh, all right, thank, thank you. you. Moving on to the next item, 5E, uh, uh, draft transportation pro, uh, priorities. All right, good afternoon, board members. Uh, we're gonna walk through the annual adoption of the transportation priorities, but this is not an action item for you today. This is just kind of your first look at it. A final will be brought back to you for action at your next meeting, May. So you know, there are two lists in your packet, and we're going to take them one at a time. Uh, the first one is the multimodal priority list. This is reviewed on an annual basis and adopted on an annual basis. 
We do put the priorities um, that we want FDOT to take kind of off the top. We put them higher up on the priority list. When we send it to FDOT, they really just look at number one and they start funding the projects until they run out of money. So you'll see our complete streets projects are near the top and some of our active transportation projects. Now, as a reminder, the projects will remain on the list until they are 100% complete. So that's why you'll see two sections on the list. The top portion, those projects are unnumbered. They just have the letter P for programmed. And then the unfunded projects are then listed below those in rank order. We do an annual call for projects for the multimodal priority list and our local government partners are invited to submit applications. And this is generally the criteria as to how those projects are scored against one another and then added to the bottom of the list. Uh, safety is the biggest component that we look at when we evaluate our projects uh, from our local government partners. And then you can see the breakdown of the other, um, the other categories that are evaluated. So we have two projects that are being removed from the priority list because they have been completed. The first is the Central Ave BRT, also known as the Sunrunner, uh, since that was completed in late 20, uh, 2022. And then a segment of Pasadena Avenue from Matthews up to Central Ave that was also completed late last year. So those two priorities are coming off. We have a lot of projects this year that have been funded in the draft tentative work program and are moving forward. This is actually, I believe, at least in my time with the MPO, the largest number of projects that have advanced into the work program in one year. And you'll see all of these on your priority list in your packet as well with shading. These include uh, Alt-19 median modifications in the Dunedin area, uh, Alt-19 intersection improvements in the Largo Seminole area, 62nd Avenue Complete Streets Project, 18th Avenue South Active Transportation Project, van pool funding. Uh, it does note that that funding will go to T-BARDA. Uh, the van pool, I will note, existed before T-BARDA. It will likely exist after T-BARDA. So that funding will just go to wherever the operator is at that time and will change the responsible agency on the priority list once we have a better handle on who that will be. We've also had the 4th Street and Elmerton Trail connections advanced into the work program. These will be the connections coming off of the Howard Franklin Bridge to bring uh, cyclists and pedestrians down either 4th or Elmerton, and then the downtown Clearwater Intermodal Center as well. In terms of new project priorities, we do have a number that we're adding to the priority list this year. Uh, the first is the First Avenue South intersection improvements. Uh, up on the slide, you can see an image that's the temporary treatments that were installed by the city at First Avenue South and Second Street. This project will make those changes permanent and also apply them to the Fifth and Seventh Street intersections. This was the Complete Streets Priority Project that was awarded by this board um, and it is advancing into the work program or I'm sorry, onto the priority list. And you'll see this project is listed pretty close to the top because this is one of our off the top projects that we have committed to assigning $1 million annually to. The second project is a little vague. It's sidewalk gaps on state roadways. Florida Department of Transportation has identified a number of roadways along the state highway system uh, that have gaps in the sidewalk network. Um, we're putting this on here now as more of a placeholder. We're going to be working with the department in the next six months to identify what the priority for those sidewalk gaps would be. And they'll be working to uh, put those projects forward with carbon reduction funds to get the gaps closed. The next project is a project development and environmental study along the I-175 corridor. Uh, this is coming out of the downtown St. Petersburg mobility study. Uh, we've also had some recent conversations about also adding uh, the 3rd and 4th Street corridors in downtown St. Petersburg that are near this corridor. Um, so this is again just a draft. There may be a few slight changes when you see a final in a couple of months and that may be one that also gets added to the list related to that project. And then the next three are our local government project applications. The first is 78th Avenue North from 66th Street to 49th Street in Pinellas Park. Uh, the second is 22nd Avenue North from 58th Street to 4th Street in St. Petersburg. That's a smart corridors project to look at intersection and technology upgrades. And then the Bel Air Road uh, corridor from Keene to US 19 uh, in the county. Then there are some other smaller changes, um, such as the 22nd Street South. You'll notice some shading and some project uh, timelines changed on those. Construction was deferred on a number of those segments at the request, request of the City of St. Pete. Uh, we updated the 580 corridor description because it is underway. Duke Energy Trail and the State Road 60 crossing. Construction is in the current fiscal year. Uh, the P, uh, preliminary engineering has advanced for the Gulf Boulevard sidewalks and Indian Shores. 
I-275 project has been broken into phasing um, based on funding coming from the state. And then the Pinellas Trail Loop segment around San Martin, the project description has been updated. So for, for today, we're just asking for your review. We're looking to answer any questions that you may have. And final action will be brought back before you at your July meeting. So I'm happy to take any questions on the multimodal priority list. Thank you. All right, putting out to the board questions, uh, Councilman, Council Member Driscoll. Thank you, and thank you for that update. My question is regarding the um, I-175 PDE study. Um, we are, I'm seeing that the proposed priority number assigned to it on this draft is 16. Um, we're making some really great progress with our discussions about what, could, what the future could hold for I-175. Um, with the completion of the downtown mobility study, as well as the selection of the master developer for um, the historic gas plant district, which of course borders, um, has I-175 as one of the borders. And what we, can, what we do or don't do with I-175 is going to inform and relate to a lot of what happens on that end of this very large and generational redevelopment. It has meanings that go far beyond transportation um, when we look at what this could mean for, um, for our city and its residents. And I don't, I, I would hate to see that momentum get tripped up by a delay in this study. It sounds like right now we'd be looking at 2029, 2030 before the study was even underway. So possibly, but not necessarily. Um, so typically FDOT will start at number one and make their way down. However, there, I don't wanna say there's always like scraps of funding left over so lower cost projects can advance more quickly and we do work with FDOT to kind of have that discussion is if, if there's a little money left over obviously you're not going to be able to spend a little money reconstructing the Gandy Bridge which is the priority immediately underneath this one it would then we could then direct them to take a look at the PD&E study along I-175 so we can communicate with them if there is a desire to see that move forward more quickly than the new fifth year. Uh, when we transmit our priorities to FDOT, we include a letter that talks about some of those relative priorities. Um, so we can communicate that with them if that is the desire of the board. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And I, um, would there be um, time to have some conversations with FDOT um, as you move forward? I mean, I know this is a draft, but before you come back, Mm -hmm. um, is that something that we can uh, discuss with them? I'd be happy to engage um, with them myself, mm -hmm. if that's helpful. Absolutely, we, um, we converse with them on a regular basis, so uh, we can yes. definitely set something up. Yeah, they're fantastic to, to work with, and I know that um, my understanding is that FDOT has a good, un has um, really gets this project, this, um, this redevelopment, and what, what role um, any change to I-175 would play in that. And so I would respectfully request that we continue that discussion and consider moving it up on the priority list if possible. Okay, absolutely, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. If I could just add a little bit to that, if you may. Um, maybe it's helpful for some of our board members to just think about the, the, the big picture timeline. This is one of the most important things we do is adopt the transportation priority list. It's really a foundation for for everything after the long range transportation plan, this really has to put those projects in motion. When we send the priority list, the Florida Department of Transportation usually gives us a few months and then they come back to us with a draft tentative work program and this board is asked to send comments on that as well. So that is another opportunity for you to approve a letter of comments or objections or concerns about the draft tentative work program. So if they aren't as responsive as we hope they are in getting this funded as quickly as possible, the work program is another opportunity to comment on that and send a formal comment from the board. But I am optimistic that if we convey in our letter that this is tied to the gas plant redevelopment project and there is a timeline there, that they'll work with us and we'll see what we can do. It also does tie into the I-275 project, which we are desperately mm -hmm. trying to get funded. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but 
if we can get that regionally significant project funded, it does tie in directly to what we might look at at 175 as well. Thank you. That's encouraging. Thank you. All right. Any other members have any questions? All right. I don't see any more. Thank you very much. All right. I'll move on to the next one. The yep. other priority list in your packet is transportation alternatives. Um, so we don't usually like to keep more than one priority list because it can be very confusing. But transportation alternatives is a very specific federal grant program that is targeted just towards bicycle and pedestrian projects. It's not a whole lot of money. We do limit our applicants to no more than $3 million projects because of the size of the pot of money. If we were to put a pedestrian overpass uh, on this list, it would probably eat up about three or four years of funding. So we keep it to smaller scale projects. Um, we do allow our jurisdictions to submit uh, two uh, applications each year. Um, and we do require some kind of local commitment, 100% of the right of way uh, to be available as well. And really, the structure of this program is to make sure that as the projects come on, they can very quickly move into the work program and get funded so they don't sit around, get stale, and then the local governments end up not even wanting the federal money at the end of the day if it takes 10 years to get it. So we are proposing to add a number of projects to our, our priority list this year. Um, but the success that we had with the work program, we've had three of our priorities from last year advance into the construction phase. Those include sidewalks along 46th Street North in the Lelman community, the con uh, construction funding for a separated bike lane along 6th Street in downtown St. Petersburg, and also a separated bike lane on 28th Street in, uh, near the Edge District of St. Petersburg. For new priorities, we received five applications uh, from our local government partners, um, and we scored them all. And at the end of the day, we made the decision as staff that these are all very good projects. And with additional funding coming through the bipartisan infrastructure law, there, do, there does seem to be some hope that we could possibly get, at, if not all of these funded within the next year, maybe a majority of them. So we'd like to propose adding them all to the priority list. And these are the projects here up on the screen. Uh, the City of St. Petersburg submitted for the Pinellas Trail Neighborhood Connections. This is multiple neighborhood connections to the trail throughout the city. Uh, Tarpon Springs submitted for the Sunset Beach Connector. It's just over four miles of bike ped infrastructure improvements from the Howard Causeway all the way through Klosterman. Uh, Tarpon Springs also submitted for the Distant Ave Complete Streets, and that's going to look at sidewalks and intersection improvements from Klosterman all the way up to Live Oak Boulevard. Uh, St. Petersburg submitted for the 26th Avenue South Trail. Uh, that would be the connecting the Skyway Trail over to 21st Street. And then also Grand Central uh, District crossings throughout the, the Grand Central District of St. Petersburg. So again, next steps are very much the same as the other one. We bring these projects to you here today for any questions or comments. And final action will be taken in July. So I'm happy to take any questions that you have. All right. Any questions from the board? Yes. Commissioner Edwards. Um, yeah. So... As it relates to bike lanes, um, you know, I've been hearing more and more about not only uh, riders' issues with bike lanes um, and how wide they are or how, how they're not really separated from traffic. Mm -hmm. Drivers' concerns with them as well. Um, so just wondered what kind of work is being done in terms of making it a safer passageway for bikes. And then uh, comment on that, but also like to understand what this cycle track is, which uh, the person who was here earlier today speaking about down on Tier, in Tier Verde on the Bayway mm -hmm. sounds just absolutely terribly unsafe, mm -hmm. but just maybe some comments on that. So. Well, to your first question, um, the bike lanes that are being proposed through these appli applications, they're not going to be like the Ulmerton Road bike lane. These are going to be separated bike lanes on the sides of the street uh, that have some kind of physical barrier separating the vehicles from the traffic. Um, not unlike MLK in St. Petersburg, where there are gaps where cars can turn into driveways and things like that, but there is a physical separation between the bikers and the cars. These are also very low-volume roadways, 6th Street and 28th Street. They're not very high volume. There's not a lot of conflicts, not a lot of traffic on those corridors. So the city will be designing the bike lanes to ensure as much safety as possible in that shared space. So my fellow commissioner across the way, who is actually a biker, mm -hmm says it, the, the separators are important, what you use and what you shouldn't use. Mm -hmm. so, uh, we're not talking about concrete separators, like low, you mm -hmm. know. So the exact design, I'd have to defer to the city on. I'm not even sure they've gotten to the full design portion, because uh, this grant funding will go directly to the city. So I'd have to defer to city staff. 
but we can get that information and get that back to you. And the second one? And the cycle track down on Tier Verde, I don't know if anyone from the district is prepared to respond uh, to that since it's an FDOT project. I, I can say as to that project, that has been a Ford Pinellas priority for a number of years, uh, but the exact design of it, Brian would love to speak to that. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Not a problem. Good afternoon, commissioners. Brian Hunter with the Florida Department of Transportation. We're aware of the, the concerns with the cycle track down there, and we are planning on uh, performing a before and after study to see if it is a safe condition. We believe that it is, um, but we're going to take a look at that and make sure that we have safe facilities out there for all users of the roadway. So typically, I think you were asking, like, what the design of the cycle track is. I am not 100% certain on that road. I haven't been down there since it's been constructed. Um, but typically, they're a separated two-way bicycle facility. And the concerns are um, driveway access. People may not be used to looking left and right uh, to um, see bicyclists that are coming from the opposite direction of what they're typically used to. But I think that's something that education, signage, and just time can um, yeah. address. Uh, well, education, that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, we're trying to do the same thing on the trails that we've always been doing, the tr you know, walking on the walkers on one side, the bikers on the other. And now we're trying to educate people that they need to, all people are on your state of the right, regardless of whether you're a biker or you're a walker or you're, you know, whatever. So I find that to be extremely problematic, and I think it's, it's wishful thinking. Um, so I'm just, I'd like to hear more about this cycle track thing and see, just to make sure we understand it so we can have input on our... Yes, um, if you all would like, we'd be more than happy to come back and, you know, show a visual of what it is, a, a typical section type, of, and also some... That would photos. be great. That would yeah. be great. Thank you. Safety folks to talk. We, we can bring that back at a future meeting. Thank you. I, I do want to point out that we have a two-way cycle track um, in St. Petersburg that's part of the Pinellas Trail through downtown that is separated by, by concrete. And uh, it seems to work pretty well uh, through there, but I understand that you know there can be some issues. I think what Commissioner Scott mentioned at the workshop the other day was really um, a different context than, than the Pinellas Trail through downtown. It was more of if you've got like a small uh, concrete median or sporadic concrete medians that they become a real hazard in getting in and out of that bike lane for um, at least the Pinellas Trail section through downtown St. Petersburg. There is no really getting in and out of that trail until you're at an intersection. Okay. So it's, um, it's a different design. It's a different, yeah. okay. Cycle tracks are something that we don't see a lot of uh, in Florida, but they've become a little bit more popular. Um, part of the rationale for, for thinking about why to do them is that it, it does tend to put cyclists in one place and it gives you the ability to separate them from the traffic, potentially with on-street parking, um, you know, where they're on the other side of the parking and between the parking and the curb. For instance, that's a common application. And it gives people maybe easier access to businesses on one side of the street. I think in the Terra Verde example, we've got it on both sides. Um, with a cycle track only on one side, and I, I really don't understand the rationale, so we'd have to get yeah. that presentation. Uh, yeah, I would think that would be a problem, and when you're pulling out or whatever, uh, thinking you're always looking in one direction for right. that kind of traffic, and now you're having to look. So it'd be confusing. I certainly understood the concerns that, that was that were raised. So thank and maybe you. maybe we could also touch on it in terms of the Drew Street project, which I'll talk about in a minute because that short section on the far western end, the current design shows a two-way cycle track between Myrtle and Osceola where it interfaces with the Pinellas Trail. And I think the rationale there is if I'm coming southbound on the trail, I may want to go right to Coachman Park or I may want to go left to the rest of the trail that goes south. And so a cycle track facilitates that easy access on that north side. At least I can speak more to the rationale behind that one. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other members have questions? Yes, Council Member Floyd. Mike, please. Oh, I forgot. Uh, I just wanted to advocate a little bit um, for, for one of the projects on the unfunded list. Um, I'm happy with the way that things are, but if there's any opportunity to move anything forward, the uh, Grand Central 
district and St. Petersburg Street Crossing, we've had a lot of issues with street safety around there. Uh, it's quite popular area, heavily foot traffic, and we've had a couple of fatalities over the last couple of years. Um, so anything we can do to make um, crossing the street in that area safer, I would uh, love to support, and I just wanted to uh, give that plug for it. Oh, thank you. All right, thank you, Council Member Floyd. Any other members? All right, not seeing any. There's no action on this one, so thank you very much. All right, we're going to move on to the next item, uh, F5 Sunrunner Update presented by PSTA. Good afternoon, esteemed board members of Ford Pinellas. Uh, my name is Whitney Fox, and I'm the Director of Communications and Marketing for PSTA. I'm here with my colleague, Abhishek Dayal, uh, and we are here to give you a presentation on an update on the Central Avenue BRT, known as the Sunrunner. I just want to mention you might be familiar with our colleague, Heather Sobush, who would normally be here presenting, and I am helping fill in for her today as she has a family emergency, but just wanted to give her credit for all of her work on this project and this presentation. So as you may know, our Central Avenue BRT, the very first true bus rapid transit project in the Tampa Bay region, known as the Sunrunner, did launch October 21st of 2022. Thank you for all who attended to celebrate with us. If you're not familiar with the route of the Sunrunner, it does connect downtown St. Petersburg uh, to St. Pete Beach. Uh, and it connects to many different places of employment, such as uh, medical facilities, hospitals, even uh, areas uh, such as restaurants, local shopping, as well as the USF St. Pete campus um, and the Tropicana Field where the Rays play and many other important locations that our residents as well as tourists alike are visiting along this area. If you're not familiar with all of the features of the Sunrunner, it is fast. It gets from the beach to the berg in 35 minutes or less. It's frequent. One thing that's making it very popular is that it does come every 15 minutes. It's clean with low emission hybrid electric vehicles. It's timely running from 6 a.m. till midnight every day. We are connecting a lot of people to um, the workforce and residents with over 50,000 jobs uh, and 40,000 people within a half mile of the Sunrunner route. Of course, this was our number one ridership corridor, which is why it was presented to have the BRT in this area. And it's affordable. It is free through October 31st of 2023. Further features of Sunrunner, we do have bus and turn lanes along six and a half miles of the 10 mile route. This is where, of course, the Sunrunner is dedicated to these lanes, but we also allow for vehicles to use as turning lanes. We also have 30 uniquely branded station platforms with real bus time arrival information. Now these platforms, maybe you've seen them if you've driven along the route in St. Petersburg uh, or South Pasadena or St. Pete Beach, but in the St. Petersburg area specifically, a lot of them have artwork on the stations. Now this isn't just any artwork. We actually worked with a local artist, Catherine Woods, who went around each neighborhood and took pictures of the flora, fauna, and architecture and created a unique piece of art for every single station. And this was a, a huge part of the project to make sure that we really truly connected with the residents and created a project for them to be proud of in their community. Uh, we also have artwork featured on the buses themselves. If you're familiar with our local artist, Chad Mize, in the city of St. Petersburg, his uh, infamous Mr. Sun is on the design of the Sunrunner vehicles. We also have transit, transit signal priority along the route, as well as onboard bike racks, allowing us to provide more access to more bikes per vehicle, and dual door boarding, which is allowing us to increase the amount of time, um, or I'm sorry, decrease the amount of time people take to get on board. Instead of one door, they can board with both doors being open. Like I mentioned earlier, um, we are having free fares until November. Our fare-free period has been extended, so we will have one full year of free fares on the Sunrunner, which we're really excited about uh, to attract and get people to try it, to, to come out and have a frictionless way to get on board just um, come to the nearest station. You're gonna wait 15 minutes or less and people are really happy to just be able to walk right on. Uh, and we do have contactless payments that we just implemented throughout our PSTA fleet that once we do start charging fares come November, uh, we will be able to have people 
tap to pay with their phones or their credit cards that have that capability. I'm going to hand the presentation over to uh, my colleague, Abhishek, to talk about the more uh, detailed information about the project. Thanks, Whitney, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Abhishek Dayal. I'm the Director of Project Management at PSDA. Uh, it's great to be here uh, with uh, amongst all of you. So I want to start off with just reminding the group that this project was extremely successful in securing the federal grant, uh, the most sought after federal grant uh, for this project. Uh, FTA, or Federal Transit Administration, chipped in almost half of the funding for this project. Uh, we also had uh, partnerships with uh, Florida DOT and City of St. Petersburg, as well as PSTA also provided uh, capital reserve funding uh, for this project. Now, even better news is uh, after the project was completed, we realized uh, some significant savings uh, for this project. And uh, we are actually in discussions with uh, FTA to utilize those savings to make some additional enhancements uh, to the Sunrunner project, uh, such as uh, adding another station uh, close to the St. Pete Pier, which would really open up the, the service to several destinations along the pier in downtown, uh, including the connections to the uh, Cross Bay Ferry and even bring uh, tourists and re residents from across the bay. Uh, we're also looking to purchase additional Sunrunner buses, uh, given the demands that we've seen, uh, particularly during the special events, which I'm going to talk about uh, later on. So as it relates to the ridership numbers that we've seen thus far, uh, Sunrunner has been the most productive route between Monday through Saturday. Uh, and on Sundays, it's the second most productive route, just behind Route 52, which is the longest route uh, PSTA operates, connecting uh, Clearwater to St. Petersburg. Uh, the busiest stops on the Sunrunner are on First Avenue and Fifth Street, just across from the Municipal Services Building uh, in St. Petersburg. Uh, Grand Central Station, where a lot of people make connections to other uh, bus routes going to north of the county or south of the county. And then finally, the Beach Access Park, which is a key destination that the Sunrunner connects. That's also one of the busiest uh, stops uh, on this corridor. And if you can see the, the graph here, you can see our ridership, the monthly ridership has been climbing uh, every single month. Uh, we started off, of course, uh, we opened in October 21st, so you only see the 10 days of ridership on the far left. And then in March, we exceeded 115,000 uh, riders, uh, and we keep seeing increases uh, every single month. A little bit more detail into what types of ridership and when we're see, seeing that high ridership, what you see are a collection of four bars uh, one uh, for each month. Uh, so the blue bar, the dark blue bar, indicates the average daily ridership from Monday through Thursday, uh, so a, a typical weekday. The orange bar indicates the Friday uh, average ridership. Um, the light blue is the uh, average Saturday ridership, and then yellow is the Sunday ridership. Now, traditionally, the weekday ridership is really the highest, and then Saturdays and Sundays and Fridays are, tend to be lower but in case of Sunrunner, we're seeing really uh, high demand for weekend ridership, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And then also, the, if you look at the weekday ridership, the dark blue bars, those seem to be climbing up too from when we were in October all the way to, to March. Uh, with regards to looking at the corridor ridership, so all the routes that we operate on the Sunrunner corridor, besides the Sunrunner, You'll notice that the dark blue line here, that was the, the ridership in the corridor before Sunrunner. And then the light blue or the teal color uh, uh, graph, that is the Sunrunner ridership. And that really caused the overall corridor ridership, uh, which is shown by orange, uh, really to go up quite a bit, which means that we're actually attracting new ridership to the corridors, not simply people switching from one bus route to another within the same corridor. Um, and then as, as far as special event ridership, we've seen tremendous demand uh, with all the special events that uh, whether St. Petersburg has uh, hosted or elsewhere in the corridor. Uh, you can see uh, going from left to right on that table, 
opening weekend, uh, followed by Halloween on Central in October, New Year's Eve. Localtopia was a huge uh, ridership success for us. We actually exceeded more than 5,000 riders on Saturday. Uh, and then the Grand Prix weekend was also super successful. We had uh, 40, more than 4,700 riders on Saturday and more than 4,200 riders on, uh, on Sunday. Um, even beyond that, uh, we had the opening day, we had the spring training, uh, all the race games, and they're on a streak right now, so we, we see a lot of uh, people actually using uh, Sunrunner uh, quite a bit. And here are some photos of uh, actually some of the riders who sent us those uh, photos of the crowded buses. Um, so we've been actually deploying uh, additional buses to meet those demands during those special events um, uh, throughout the event of duration. Now, talking about the safety aspects of this project, and I do want to thank uh, Forward Pinal staff for, for the incredible work that they did in getting us the safety uh, traffic crashes uh, information. Uh, on the left, you will see the uh, number of crashes between October and February, uh, so October of 2021 and February of 2022, so before Sunrunner. And then for the same months from October of 2022, when Sunrunner opened, to February of 2023, you can see the number of crashes have actually come down. Um, and that's also something that uh, St. Pete Police Department has verified. They've told us that the, they are seeing less incidents along the corridor. Uh, so we continue to see a lot of progress on, on that front as well. Talking about transit signal priority, which was a unique thing for the Sunrunner project, and this was to implement it so that the buses could stay on schedule. So if buses are getting five minutes or more behind schedule, they can actually request uh, either one of the traffic signals to turn green or stay green a little bit longer so that those buses can get through the intersection and essentially catch up to their, to their schedule. Um, as you can see here, this is just a snapshot of all the intersections that we had requested a signal priority. And for the most part, uh, the signal priority was granted. In some cases, just to keep the traffic flowing, the, it was not uh, granted. So for the most part, it has been working uh, really well for, for this corridor. And to give you another context in this, this the orange bar indicates the, um, the scheduled travel time for, for the buses. So when they start early in the morning, that's the left-hand side, uh, to all the way to midnight when the buses end their run, the orange line indicates what the scheduled travel time should be. And the blue is the actual travel times uh, that the buses actually encounter. And if you see here, most of the times the buses are actually within schedule or actually ahead of schedule thanks to traffic signal priority, thanks to all the level boarding and all the enhancements that Whitney also uh, mentioned. And so with that, I'm going to turn it right back to Whitney to make some closing remarks. Thank you, Abhishek. I let him talk about all of the data information. So overall, to summarize, uh, we're really happy to present that Sunrunner has had high ridership. We're really happy with the success of the launch of the service. Uh, we've seen a decrease in vehicular crashes, which obviously is um, a plus in promoting safer streets for our community. Um, Thanks to Abhishek and his project management uh, at PSTA, we have uh, become significantly under budget for the project. And what I think is a really big positive and want to bring attention to is the increased positive public sentiment for public transportation that Sunrunner has provided. We have many people who've never ridden PSTA before who might even own a car and have no need or to, to ride public transportation, but they want to because of the fast, frequent service of the Sunrunner. Uh, it has drastically improved our uh, public sentiment on public transportation, we believe, uh, throughout the county for anyone who has tried uh, riding the Sunrunner service. And I want to end on just letting you know that as we did launch on October 21st, this a April 21st, we will be celebrating the first six months of Sunrunner with a media event at the location of where our new station will be at First and First in downtown St. Petersburg. We'd love to uh, invite you to join us to celebrate and also discuss uh, what it will mean to add this new station to the service. Thank you so much for your time. We're here to answer any questions you might have. Want to back one, report? Yes, just one question. Um, on page 11, you showed some ridership um, numbers and the, I guess the um, the blue was the 
last year, the previous years uh, before Sunrunner existed. Is that right? The dark blue, yes. Yeah. And the other is so so ridership, and, and and what were the rates like then versus? Well, obviously they're free now, but what were the rates? Average rates, if you will. So the Central Avenue trolley is actually free uh, even before Sunrunner between downtown and Grand Central uh, Terminal. Um, and then west of Grand Central Terminal, the, the rates are $2.25, which is our regular rate. For, for all riders? For all riders, correct. And, um, so, and then the red there is, represents what? The riders on the Sunrunner and any other bus service? That's correct. That runs along that same corridor? That's exactly right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Eggers. Other council members? Yes, Council Member Mo Thank you, Chair. Mohammed. Thank you for the presentation. Um, very informative. Just a quick question about um, what are you hearing or what is the data suggestion on the impact around traffic in surrounding areas um, as people, you know, try to maneuver in some cases avoid going down First Avenue so they may take Central or they may, you know, drive through neighborhoods. Has there been any data to show what the impact has been on people who, you know, get frustrated and turn off and go into neighborhoods and, you know, things of that sort? And yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, and that's something that we will work with uh, Ford Pinellas and, and staff to understand where the traffic volumes are, um, because that's something we also had discussed. You know, if, the, if there are dedicated lanes, um, which means the number of through lanes is, is, are fewer, does that mean that the traffic spills over to the neighborhoods or Fifth Avenue North and, and other adjacent streets? That's definitely something we can uh, look at uh, working with the staff. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Council. I will, I, just to add to that, I will say anecdotally, talking to people within the neighborhoods and different neighborhood associations, um, even driving on Central Avenue or in the neighborhoods, it's going to be a much slower uh, with all the stops and stop signs versus the First Avenue. So some feedback that we have received that people feel safer pulling out to turn left. For example, coming from, like, from South, turning left onto First Avenue North. It used to be a little bit scary to inch out into that oncoming traffic, but now with the, the bus and turn lane, you can feel a little bit safer turning into the bus and turn lane and then merging into traffic. So a lot of people were a little bit nervous about that, but we've heard a lot of positive feedback anecdotally from the neighborhood associations. Anybody else? You're welcome. Uh, my comment, I haven't used it yet, <laughs> but uh, I, had, I have had a couple of my citizens reach out and said they've used it and really enjoyed it. Um, and I have many friends that, I, that I've seen on Facebook posting photos of them riding it, and they like love it and share it out there. So it looks great, and then keep it up and look forward. Can you send all of uh, to Ford Pinellas the uh, April 21st event so maybe they can get it out to the locals and everything? So Absolutely. We will send you that invitation, no problem. And what can we do to get you to come? To come try it, Commissioner. <laughs> We're going to hold you to it. Okay, now you have to try. Pick, pick an adult beverage, please. <laughs> I will work on that. Tacos. That's a good one. That's tacos. <laughs> so, but I'll get down there. So, thank you so much. This is no action. This is just a. Uh, oh, yes, Commissioner. Uh, Council just a couple quick questions. Have you had any conversation with St. PPD about traffic enforcement of vehicles that are using the bus lane that shouldn't be? Okay, so first question. Yes, uh, we not only engaged the St. PPD, but also the Sheriff's Office. Um, f as soon as we constructed those bus and turn lanes, uh, we worked with them on the educational aspects. Um, you know, basically just engaging with the motorists to educate what those bat lanes are, since this is kind of the first in the Tampa Bay region. Uh, so there were some learning curve involved, but anecdotally, I see a lot of compliance uh, along First Avenue North and South. Follow-up? Sure. Just so your ridership number is total passengers counting each direction, not trips. That's right, yes, okay. total. Thank you, Council Burke. Commissioner Burke, Scott. Scott. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Smith. Um, what sort of uh, experience have we had with, with damage to Sunrunner buses regarding accidents and, and things like that? Do we have, are all the buses in service right now? Are they available for service? What, what's been that history? So we, we did see a few incidents where uh, some of the buses were, uh, did have some accidents uh, along the Sunrunner. Uh, and this, again, 
was part of the bus and turn lanes that we are working with not only the our drivers but the motorists also to make sure that they use those in the right way. Um, but we have seen a few incidents where the Sunrunner buses were hit uh, by motorists. Um, but you know, I, I think, and maybe Whitney can confirm this, but I believe we have all the buses, the Sunrunner buses that are operating right now. So they're all in service right now? Did, did we have any significant downtime relative to those accidents? In one or two situations, we did. Uh, so we had to utilize one of our other buses um, to be able to run on the Sunrunner. And that's and the fact that we are all using 40-foot hybrid electric buses, that makes it easier for us to be able to deploy uh, the service. I should also mention that during the special events, the, those plug buses that we used, those were also our regular buses just to keep the, the loads uh, to meet the needs of the, the special events. Question about the um, arrival times, and so, and so seeing that a lot of the buses arrive ahead of schedule, do they also leave ahead of schedule, or do they wait until the scheduled time to depart, so that people who may, you know, be running, I've, I've caught the bus, and sometimes you run and they catch it, uh, and you get there right at the time that it's supposed to depart. So are we waiting for those people, or are we just there early, you, whoever there, we pick them up, keep going, and you catch the next one? It, it really depends on the situation. So if the buses are way ahead of schedule, then, then obviously we, we don't want to make sure that you know, people miss their connections. Uh, but it, it's really meant to be in a way that every rider waiting at the bus stop, they actually see buses every 15 minutes. So if there are buses that are ahead of schedule, the next bus is right behind it, we don't want that type of situation occur. So we've been working with our operations team to make sure there's adequate gap. And you, know, you only see a bus every 15 minutes at every single station. So just to follow up, so, that, so there would be times where a bus may have to stay there at that time and wait. And then in other cases, they, they may leave early to con have that consistency of the, the gap, the 15 That's right, yes. OK. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yes, Council Member. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm looking at slide 10. And I'm just curious on the weekday ridership. I see this is the first month, March, that there was a drop in ridership. Do you still predict that to level out? And is there any attempt to grow that ridership throughout the week? So, I mean, there might be some seasonal uh, variations because March, you know, there was spring break. So, uh, you know, a lot of people had uh, a week off. Uh, the schools were closed. So we might be attributing that uh, due to, you know, causing the dip, slight dip in uh, ridership. But I expect that to pick back up uh, this month. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it varies quite a bit, um, you know, given the seasonality. Just uh, one quick comment and a question. Uh, the comment is, uh, if the board's not aware, uh, we are working with PSTA on a transit-oriented development plan for the corridor as well. Um, we've completed phase one. Rodney's been our project manager for that. We'll be moving into phase two, already moving into phase two. And uh, that is really looking at how do we intensify and incentivize more walkability and those kinds of activities around the station, typically quarter mile to a half mile around those station areas. And there's been a lot of conversation with the city of St. Petersburg, and we're looking now at uh, applying that first phase um, analysis and research into two specific uh, station area plans in, in along the Sunrunner corridor. Um, as we get out of the downtown, I think it's 22nd Street, and can you tell me the other one? 32nd. 32nd. All right, good. Let's see, we should have Rodney up here. Um, the question I had for you is I know when St. Petersburg looked at um, modifications to uh, ML King Street and 9th Street North, that they did a before and after <clears throat> analysis of the economic impact of those changes. And I know, Whitney, you've done some anecdotal interviews with, with business owners and, and, and how they're perceiving the Sunrunner, but what I'd love to be able to say is that we've looked at it in that first year sometime, what are those impacts, and then later on, maybe two or three years down the road, as we start seeing more transit-oriented development and the fares are back in, can we quantify the economic uh, impetus that the Sunrunner is providing to the corridor? So a couple of things. Uh, so one of the things that we're also looking at 
and, and I didn't present it here, but the uh, number of developments that we're seeing along the corridor. Uh, in, in concert with the land use study or the TOD planning study, before Sunrunner and post Sunrunner, how much development has occurred. Uh, so that's, that's a good uh, guide, not only for the development that's been attracted to the corridor, but also potential ridership in the future. Uh, the second thing that we're doing, uh, we'll actually be starting that next month, is the, uh, we're doing the community bus plan. And, and as part of that community bus plan, we are going to be doing an onboard survey uh, to really understand how people are getting to the Sun Runner, whether they walk, they bike, they connect. Uh, and that is a good um, a proxy, essentially, for the pedestrian activities that one would expect at every single station. Um, and, and again, you know, that could tie to where they are going. If they are getting off at uh, 22nd Street, are they getting a coffee at the Black Crow Coffee, uh, coffee Shop? So those are types of anecdotal, uh, I think, information that might be helpful to, to what you're saying, Whit. Any other questions for me? Yes, council member. Just one more since you brought that up. Have, has the PSTA considered any park and ride locations anywhere along the route? So if you, you can drive to an area and then get on the Sun Runner, because if you're already driving, and you, you might as well drive all the way downtown if you're driving. So has that ever been in discussion? I'll start by saying we actually, that's been a question a lot of people have said is, well, I don't live along the route, how can I park and ride? And maybe this is to help you, encourage you to come ride. Um, we actually just updated our interactive map on our website to um, highlight where there are parking opportunities. There are actually, without there being a park and ride designated area, there are a lot of places to park near all of the Sunrunner stations, um, many of them free, some of them um, obviously uh, pay to park. So that's one thing that we're trying to make sure that we educate the community about is here are the locations if you would like to, to ride or to drive and park in order to ride the Sunrunner. But I don't know if you want to touch on any discussions, uh, but that's what we're, where we are at the moment. Okay, thank you. Great question. Thank you, council member. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we're going to move on to item 5G, uh, draft MOU for regional MPO. Uh, we'll be presenting. Thank you. I'll take this one. Um, I, I'm not going to give the PowerPoint presentation that's in your packet, but it's there for reference, just in the interest of time, and I can cover any points in there. I wanted to let you all know that we had a, um, I thought, a pretty uh, productive uh, dialogue at our March 24th meeting of the Regional Transportation Management uh, Area Leadership Group which is the MPO representatives from this MPO, Pinellas, Pasco, and Hillsborough. And that was pretty much the topic of the day, was uh, presenting to them a draft memorandum of understanding. What you have in your packet is a updated, slightly revised version of that that reflected some of the comments we received, which were mostly pretty minor in nature. They wanted the tone shifted here or there. Um, but there was general support, I would say, and I'd be welcome to have uh, Council Member Driscoll or Commissioner Eggers um, reinforce that. Um, not unanimous support, but I think general support in exploring this MOU and a potential merger of the three MPOs. What I wanted to do is get on paper some of the expectations and clarify the steps and the requirements of establishing an MPO um, and, and really just signaling to uh, folks in Tallahassee, our state representatives, the governor, whoever else may be interested, that we are working on this solution ourselves and we hope to be able to resolve it without intervention from Tallahassee. Uh, that would be ideal. Um, I also felt it was important for us to get on paper some of the uh, unique characteristics of our region that have prevented us from having a single MPO for many, many years because the excuse or the justification has been that we are too distinct uh, in each county to have a regional MPO function effectively. We have uh, more diversity in one county, we have different population characteristics in another county, uh, we have different land use patterns, we have a lot of cities in one county, not a lot of cities in another county. And you know, the reality is that those are all issues every MPO faces, no matter where they are, uh, but they've been used as justification for why we need three in this region. And there are some differences. Uh, for instance, this body, Ford Pinellas, functions in a very different manner because we have a land use responsibility and we've worked to integrate land use and transportation. 
And that's not a similar model that Hillsborough or Pasco has. So we wanted to acknowledge that in creating a regional MPO, let's not lose some of the things that we've done well, uh, that seem to be working well, and see if that can be integrated into this new structure. Uh, the other issue is that there's a sense of urgency on a lot of folks uh, in elected office and non-elected office uh, who feel like we can just do this and do it tomorrow and make it happen and let's go. And the reality is, is that the MPO process, if you haven't figured it out yet, is highly scrutinized, uh, is very transparent. We have a lot of review and certification by the state, by the federal agencies. And what we have to do to, to be able to receive federal money and to have federal funding uh, flow to our um, urbanized area is make sure that we have documents in place that uh, have been endorsed by the board or adopted by the board. Uh, we have to meet federal requirements and state statutory requirements. And before we decertify one MPO and try to certify another MPO, we wanna make sure all those things are in place. And our estimation is that may take three to four years for that to happen. So you had an earlier discussion about our apportionment plan. That needs to go forward in the wake of the census because even if it's two or three or four years, we're gonna need a plan moving forward for how we work as an individual MPO. And then when we're ready, this MOU says July of 2027, uh, with the new fiscal year, we would be in a position to stand up the MPO. Uh, it doesn't 100% commit us to that time frame, but that is the aspirational goal, and I think we can get there. From a, um, a next step standpoint, this MOU um, is still draft. Uh, it, like I said, it's only had one meeting of review. Uh, my counterparts in Hillsborough and Pasco are taking this MOU to their boards, and they are seeking um, support from those boards to begin the roadshow, talking with the city of Tampa, talking with the Hillsborough County Board of County Commissioners. Um, I'm doing the same with our local government partners here. We've begun to schedule those meetings, but we haven't gone to any yet because I wanted to make sure you were good uh, with this MOU and okay with us having those conversations with our local government partners, our chambers of commerce, anybody who has an interest in transportation, both local and regional. And, and I've got a, obviously a heavier lift than, than my counterparts in Pasco and Hillsborough because we have so many more entities to meet with. Hopefully, uh, by October or November, we'll conclude those meetings. Uh, we will bring back any revisions to the MOU for you all to adopt, uh, and then that will put us on a path for, for working this uh, through the process. I've taken on the responsibility, and I don't know if my staff knows it yet, of putting together a draft budget uh, for what this new, MO, uh, this new MPO might look like. Uh, Beth Alden in Hillsborough County has taken on the responsibility of putting together an apportionment plan uh, based on population, which would look at the constitution of the board given the state statute limitations of 25 governing board members. And um, that, I'm sure both of those things will generate a lot of discussion. We plan to bring those two items back to the TMA leadership group in September. So I don't know that they'll be final at that point. Uh, but at least it gives people an idea of what to look for. In the PowerPoint itself, I do have some pros and cons, and I think it's important just to mention a few right now, That at least my way of thinking. Um, some of the uh, pros of creating a regional MPO is that I think it gives you an opportunity to build trust and collaboration across county lines, and, and I think that's something that um, regions that are successful have that trust. Um, they, they have a, a spirit of collaboration, a spirit of teamwork, and a, a recognition that not everything's gonna be the same and we all have differences, but that we're willing to work together for the greater good. Um, defining the transportation agenda. I think um, when we are um, separated, uh, we can't really define the regional transportation agenda. We sort of are in more of a reaction mode. And I think this has enabled the Florida Department of Transportation District 7 to be more of an agenda setter for that. And for some things they should be, for other things maybe the MPO should be. I think this will allow us to compete more effectively with other regions for funding. And I think that's a big one. It does not guarantee us any more money than we get today. Um, but that spirit of collaboration and, and trust and partnership um, is sort of the collective will that says, you know what, we have a lot of resources in this region, let's aim high and let's see if we can commit our resources and then bring more resources into the region. 
And I think if Secretary Gwynne was here today, he might tell you that Orlando has been punching above its weight for a number of years because they have a regional MPO that, that has done some really big things with the Wakaiva Parkway, the Beltway, with Sunrail, uh, with other projects. And, um, and, and he and I both lived in that region for a long time. Aligning regional transportation with regional economic development. Uh, currently, we do not have a single regional economic development entity for the Tampa Bay area. That's another gap that we have. The Tampa Bay Partnership used to fill that, uh, but then they changed their business model and they are no longer a regional economic development entity. So we've been sort of collaborating and working together and kind of like the transportation agencies, it works in, in some ways, it doesn't work maybe in all the ways it could. And then finally, we'd be the largest MPO in the state of Florida, and that population base would certainly have some pull. We would have more legislative delegation members involved. We'd have more congressional representation involved, and I think it would be an opportunity to really sell the assets of the Tampa Bay area. I gotta point out some cons. Um, there is a risk that smaller communities and neighborhoods could lose influence. It's a risk, I think, can be mitigated. That was something that came up in the apportionment plan earlier. It's something Tarpon Springs has expressed. Uh, Atlanta, uh, we gave a nice presentation on their livable communities uh, uh, program that they've implemented. They have 22 counties. Uh, they have managed to figure out a way to fund really small scale projects, planning efforts, and small projects in a lot of the cities in those 22 counties. Uh, by setting up a, a program where cities can apply for those funds. I think we can do something very similar. Orlando, for instance, has a, uh, has an, a local elected officials advisory committee. So if you're not fortunate to be one of the people who are sitting around the table on, a, on the regional MPO, you can be part of an advisory committee that advises, and I think that's worked out well for the Metroplan Orlando region. It doesn't guarantee any more funding or change the need for operating funds for transit. One of the big complaints that we've heard in regional discussions is you're just rearranging the deck chairs. Um, the issue is we don't have funding for transit. The transit operations are way underfunded. Um, and that may be true, depending on your perspective. Uh, it's true that MPOs don't bring operating dollars for transit. But if we can see that there are projects advancing that unite the region, provide faster travel times, grow ridership, then maybe there's a will to, um, to look at discretionary funding for that. It also could potentially take down more discretionary funding at the state and federal level because you have one voice that you're speaking with. Um, it, this could shift emphasis to regional projects instead of community safety, access, and mobility needs. Again, that's kind of tied to smaller communities losing influence. That's been a concern expressed, particularly in Tampa. Um, I, I think there's a model out there where we can still prioritize safety and access projects uh, that serve neighborhoods. Um, it doesn't necessarily guarantee we're gonna try and impose um, a Pasco highway solution on downtown Tampa or downtown St. Petersburg. I just don't think that's logical. Uh, but there is a risk that a regional MPO could only focus on regional projects and then that would lead a void in each county where maybe there's not the capacity to carry on those functions. Uh, and then the potential to weaken countywide planning is just a recognition that Ford Pinellas as an entity is stronger with the MPO and the PPC together than just the PPC by itself. Um, and I've seen it before and I've seen it after and I think that's a true statement. So I, I'm looking at a model where we could keep Ford Pinellas as a functioning entity while still reporting to or feeding into the regional MPO structure. So I, I think I talked about our next steps. Um, we are going to um, continue to work on this MOU um, and we'll take the feedback from the TMA leadership group and bring it back to this body as appropriate. And I'll see if anybody has any questions on that. Yes, Commissioner Burke. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Smith. Uh, quick question. Would, would, so I would assume that uh, in order to decertify uh, the existing MPOs and to create a new, merge one, that the three MPO boards and the three board of county commissioners would have to vote on that. Would the municipalities in each one of those counties have to vote on that as well? The city of Tampa would have um, statutory authority to um, support or not support the regional MPO. That's in federal law. So they kind of have what I jokingly call veto power over this. Um, you also have to get um, 
I think, I think this is right, and I'll confirm this for you later, 75% of the urbanized area population having representation that votes for it. Mm. So you, you, you know, you, it would be hard to exclude Hillsborough County in that equation. Um, you could do it, right. but you'd have to have everybody else. So 75%, would, does that mean a referendum or? It's not a referendum, it's the, it's the governing board. Okay. So you'd need the governing boards representing 75% of the Got population it. plus the largest city in the urban area. And that's, again, that's federal. The, right. and, and, you know, there's been some, there is a piece of legislation that I'll cover in a minute that's been filed that uh, doesn't mandate it, but it, it does require us to study it and look at the feasibility of it, and that's um, Senator DeSegli's bill. Um, you know, there are things that, I don't want to make any suggestions, uh, that the legislature could do to incentivize or disincentivize any action. You know, they control the budget. Um, so. You know, that, that is out there, but I don't think there's really a mechanism for the state legislature to legislatively mandate the merger because of the other federal requirements. Thanks, appreciate that. Thanks. Any other members have questions? All right, thank you. Uh, yes, just a comment. Um, yeah, I, I thought the, uh, the meeting was good. Certainly you had some, I would call it open-mindedness on, on the part of Pinellas County representatives and um, and Pasco County representatives. I'm, I'm not sure that Hillsborough County was, um, I guess, excited about it, but I, I don't necessarily think the people that are on the TMA for Hillsborough County uh, represent the voice that, that I hear a little bit about over there. So it'll be interesting to see. There's obviously some of the discussion got very parochial that the city of Tampa did. You'd think that nothing else existed in the region except the city of Tampa, which I love and I think is great, but we have clearly a whole lot more here than just that, um, and tried to point that out. Um, I've said this in a couple different places, and I, if I'm repeating myself, I apologize, but I've been a commercial realtor for a lot of years, and the commercial real estate for women uh, has an annual meeting, and they would have uh, representatives from the largest cities the mayors of the largest cities come there and have a panel. But they also had an economist there who would say oftentimes that this Tampa Bay region really has the potential to be one of the really powerful regions economically in other ways in the country if the governments could get their acts together. And I'm not sure he ever knew exactly what that meant but you know, our businesses don't care about boundaries and our colleges and universities don't care about boundaries. Um, we do, we're elected by boundaries. So, um, but the point really that they were saying was, you know, together we can really do, do more. Um, so I think, I think there's a real, this is a real good time to be looking at this. The state wants that, but I think it's good for us to look at it as well. Um, you know, the, um, I guess the, the local projects piece, we've got it kind of, I mean, I'm not saying we're perfect here, but because we have so many representatives from the cities on this board, we have figured out how to work together. I mean, I think we're pretty confident with each other. Um, I'm not saying that the county and the cities don't have issues at times, but we talk about it and we figured it out. I think maybe in other counties, it's not quite the same. They don't have the same number of cities and they haven't figured that out. And there's a lot of you know battling going on for, or projects, and this is gonna make it worse. For me, moving forward, that's gonna to have to be addressed. And that brings me to the last point I wanted to make, which is on the apportionment. I would certainly like to see, and I, and I apologize I couldn't be here last month and I was not here for that vote, but I, I would like to potentially see discussed before the November deadline on the apportionment. Is that? We need to send it. October, November time frame. Yeah, I would just like to see that looked at again. Um, I, I don't see necessarily, especially if we're moving down this path of a, of a regional, of uh, having uh, more representatives here locally to give more input to, uh, from the locals. I don't see a problem considering the, the, ta the city of Tarpon Springs request. City of Seminole has said something in the past about it. I don't necessarily have a problem looking at that myself. Um, and certainly would like to at least have the, the thoughtful consideration maybe to have that discussion in light of the fact that it was a pretty close vote last month. And I'm, not, it's, I'm only one vote anyway, so it wouldn't have mattered, but either way. 
but I just thought maybe some more discussion on that would be would be appropriate um, in light of all the things that we're talking about. But uh, I thought in general the meeting was good. It was a good first meeting, um, and clearly a, a long way to go. Um, but the conversation is kind of parallel paths. You know, what what can we do well regionally, and how do we protect our local interests? And that's going to be the ongoing discussion. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Any other questions? No? All right. Uh, moving on to the director's report. Sure. I'll be pretty quick on most of these items. Uh, the first, just spotlight update. I'll just have one item, and that is that we um, uh, we had a waterborne transportation committee meeting, and since that meeting, our staff has been uh, meeting with PSTA, um, and we will be meeting with the county. The county gave us a list of questions. Uh, regarding their potential contribution to waterborne transportation. Um, we are going to be answering those questions and then setting up a meeting with them once we've addressed their questions. And we'll see where that goes. Um, I believe PSTA is working with us and is committed to submitting a service development grant application for waterborne transportation in this next cycle. Um, and that would allow them to receive 50% funding from the state for the first three years of operating of the restart plan for the water taxi service, the Clearwater Ferry is what we're referring to. Um, that would reduce the burden, at least in the first three years on the local government partnership, and then we could truly see and measure how effective this service is and whether it should be sustained after that. So I think those are positive steps in the right direction. We'll bring something back to the board uh, as soon as we are able and schedule a, a future waterborne committee when we're ready for that. Uh, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, I'll just go right on into the legislative committee update. Go ahead. Um, the legislative committee met earlier today, uh, and we discussed a number of bills. Uh, that Senate Bill 102 is the housing bill that's been signed into law. It's got a lot of good associated with it. It's also got some preemption uh, that does um, undermine some of the local government controls on zoning, height, density. Uh, if a development brings you a 40% uh, affordable housing project, in um, a commercial or industrial area and it meets uh, the criteria in the law, you have to approve it. You have to. Um, and it can also match the height or density of anything within a mile of that jurisdiction. Um, so you really have no control over height and, and density of that development if it meets those criteria. Um, so that, that's a little alarming for us. Um, but it also provides a lot more funding for affordable housing. So there, like I said, there are some good uh, things associated with it. Uh, regional transportation planning, uh, there has been a bill that is moving uh, that would um, ask FDOT to evaluate the operating efficiencies and further a regional approach to transit uh, within the Hillsborough Area Regional Transit Authority. The initial version include merger with PSTA. That language has been removed. Uh, this is moving um, through the House and the Senate and has uh, uh, maybe one more stop, and then it's onward. Um, the FDOT would complete that evaluation by the end of this year. Um, and it doesn't preclude a merger as one option uh, that's out there. Uh, the Tampa Bay Regional Transit Authority um, sunset uh, legislation is moving forward and that has continued to be heard uh, and has advanced through its committee stop. So it looks like that may have uh, legs of passing this year. And then I learned uh, this morning uh, that there was an amendment to Senate Bill 1250 by Senator DeSegli that does address financing for FDOT projects. This is the transportation bill, but it also um, includes an amendment uh, requiring the MPOs of Hillsboro, Pasco, and Pinellas to explore consolidation. Again, it doesn't mandate it, uh, but it essentially says that we need by the end of uh, the year to provide a feasibility report on the benefits, cost, and process of consolidating. So if that bill passes, I think the MOU would be a big part of that. Also, the budget and apportionment plan that we're working on for September would be part of that. And I think we'd largely meet the requirements of this. Um, I mean, I could say right now it's feasible. It's a matter of how you do it, right? Um, one of the risks of the regional MPO that I just need to be aware of, it's not a risk so much, but I, I did share this with the county administrator, is we get our federal funding that is reimbursed by the federal government through the state. Uh, you need some money up front um, to manage your, your affairs and pay salaries and do all that sort of stuff. Uh, the way it works in Orlando is that all the local governments are charged an annual membership fee 
to be part of the MPO, and that provides the local source of revenue. We have a millage levy that provides our local source of revenue, but I don't know that we're going to have a millage levy applied to Pasco and Hillsboro. So we, if this new organization gets created, we may be looking at an annual contribution based on population like Metroplan Orlando. So that's not something that the local governments currently budget for, so I just wanted you to be aware about that. And there's no guarantee that's the model we'll pick, but it's just one that is in effect in several areas of Florida already. Um, I think I've covered most of the big pieces of legislation. I did want to mention that the budget is something that is moving forward now, and we have a House budget and a Senate budget that's working their way through to a floor vote. Uh, it is not consistent with the governor's budget in all regards, and one issue where it's not consistent is in the moving Florida forward plan that the governor proposed. Uh, you may have read about that earlier this year. I think it was $4 billion. Is that about right, Brian? Seven. $7 billion. Okay, so I had the number wrong. The governor proposed $7 billion, and the major project in the Tampa Bay area, I think it might have been the only project in the Tampa Bay area, was advancing I-275 from the Howard Franklin Bridge south to 38th Avenue North. Uh, that project would add the two managed toll lanes that are on part of the Howard Franklin Bridge. It would also um, include some other operational improvements as well. Um, that's one of our high priority projects. What I'm hearing from the Secretary is that the House and Senate versions of the budget are much lower than the $7 billion, and I, I don't have an exact dollar amount uh, right now, but his prediction would be if those two budgets were reconciled and passed at the level that they're at, it would probably result in, in, in one major project being moved forward, and that would be in the I-4 Central Florida area where 417 and I-4 converge, and it would leave I-275 out. So we talked about it at the Legislative Committee earlier today, and uh, there was general support for that, but the committee wanted this board to to authorize me, if you would so desire, to send a letter to our legislative delegation requesting that when they consider the final budget that they try to include room for the I-275 project, which is a Ford Pinellas priority um, and would be consistent with the governor's recommendation. And I'll just see if you all are interested in that, and if there's a motion and support for that, I'd welcome it. We have a motion, do I have a second? I have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We're going to move on to items uh, 6C, uh, School Transportation Safety Committee recommendations. I'll cover this one as well. Um, as you may know, we have a School Transportation Safety Committee that is comprised of um, a combination of elected officials, um, staff, school board uh, uh, representatives. Um, and school safety has been um, in the spotlight this year since an unfortunate incident in August, but it's always an issue here in Pinellas County. Uh, there are two pieces of legislation that are moving through in the House and the Senate. Uh, one of them deals with uh, speed enforcement within school zones, and there was an editorial in today's Tampa Bay Times you may have seen, co-authored by Representative Tracy Coster. Um, and then there's another uh, piece of legislation that would uh, provide for enforcement of uh, people passing school buses when they are stopped with the stop arm de deployed while they are uh, loading and unloading students. And it would authorize school districts to opt in to use technology, um, cameras essentially, to um, provide another means of enforcement. It's really hard for law enforcement, I'm sure you can attest, to be there every time there's an incident when somebody passes a stop school bus or when somebody is speeding through school zones. The school zones legislation was filed last year and made it through the Senate, but not the House. And this takes away any uh, private sector uh, incentive uh, to operate that program. It also only ticket, uh, targets people who are speeding at 11 miles per hour faster than, than the school zone speed limit. And it um, includes a period of only issuing warnings and notices before you begin issuing tickets. Um, so it's, in a lot of ways, it's not like the red light cameras uh, that, that caused so much ire before, because I don't know how you can really adjust the, uh, the school zones and the timing of that. And it would only be effect when the school zones are deployed uh, during school uh, arrival and departure times. Um, so I'll see if anybody has any questions about that, but you have the draft letter in front of you, and uh, we are seeking authorization from this board to have uh, the chair uh, or the designated vice chair sign this letter and send it to our delegation. 
open it to board. Any questions from board members? All right. Not seeing any. I'd like to, uh, 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 Tina, is there any members of the public who would like to speak on this item? No, Commissioner Smith, there isn't. And for the record on the prior vote, there were also no citizens wishing to be heard. Oh, Thank I'm you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Learning that one. Um, all right, uh, pulling it back, I need a motion. A motion, do I have a second? I have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Was Adam that Councillor Burke and Council Member Driscoll? All Britain. All Britain. Oh, all Britain, Driscoll, thank you. And uh, moving on to item 6D, Drew Street update. Okay, I could spend two hours on this one, I won't. Um, I'll spend about two minutes. Um, just wanted to let you know that this is one of our uh, first complete street grant applications that came to us from the city of Clearwater. I peppered your backup material with all kinds of attachments and information. Um, we did receive last week a letter of support from Pinellas County. Thank you, Commissioner Eggers, for your support, particularly, and Commissioner Scott for your support uh, in that the county has some concerns, just like um, I think the city has some concerns, but ultimately um, uh, there was a, a desire to work through those concerns as we move through design. Uh, the Florida Department of Transportation has been an excellent partner. They have advanced funding for not only the feasibility study, but for design. And now we have um, a significant amount of money lined up in FY24 for construction of this project. Just to be clear for everybody, the, the Drew Street is divided into three segments. The segment from um, Osceola Avenue to Myrtle in downtown Clearwater um, entails a lane repurposing to allow for a two-way cycle track, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, in a, a lower speed limit of 30 miles an hour where it interfaces with the Pinellas Trail. Um, moving from Myrtle to about Keene, uh, it would also be a lane repurpose, repurposing uh, to go from four lanes undivided to two lanes divided with a 15-foot center turn lane. We're going to have some discussion about exactly where the center medians are located, but those are needed to prohibit people from getting in that center turn lane and speeding and passing slower moving traffic which is why FDOT is adding those center islands to Alt-19 north of Dunedin. Um, and then the section from Keene East um, is a combination of State Road from Keene to Northeast Coachman, and then from Northeast Coachman to US-19, uh, it's uh, mostly a county road, and I think east of 19 it becomes a city road again. Um, but 219 is the segment, and there would essentially remain the same it would be a cross-section of five lanes with a center turn lane. Uh, the addition there is the bike lanes go from four lanes to, or four feet to five feet, and then there are some center medians to facilitate safe crossing and reduce the speeding through the center turn lane. But essentially, the capacity there stays exactly the same. Again, the county sent some letters of a um, uh, letter with some concerns. We'll add that to your next agenda item so everybody has it. Um, but it didn't happen in time for this agenda. And that's an update. I think it, it was a successful, if a little stressful week for me last week. Mike, please. Northeast Coachman is where the state begins to the west, and it goes to how far? So um, State Road 590 um, begins in Safety Harbor and it comes down that, that corridor, Northeast Coachman, and then it ties into Drew Street, and then it continues west all the way to Myrtle Avenue, okay. which is the state-maintained That's portion. the state piece there. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you. Uh, moving on to informational items. Wait, do you have anything? I do not. Uh, the only thing I had was uh, Commissioner Eggers brought up, he wanted to know about uh, uh, reconsideration, uh, about reapportionment. Uh, does this board have any appetite to bring that back? It would not be, it would be at our next meeting, am I correct? It would come out at the next meeting. Um, is there an appetite from this board to, to, to relook at that? Yes. Okay. Um, would I need to do a, let me first, do I need to do a vote on this one? I would defer to legal counsel on this, but we have talked about it prior, and I do believe the board would need to vote okay. to bring that back as an agenda item next uh, month. Okay. Let's do questions, and then we'll get there. Uh, Commissioner Scott? I, I would second it. I think it's like, sorry. I think it's worth a, another discussion. Okay. So You need a motion on this? Uh, yeah, I just want to get Commissioner Floyd, Council Member Floyd. Uh, did you have any comments before we do this? Yeah, I, w I was just going to say that... Um, if we were to reopen it, I'd like to see 
um, us instead of just talking about like adding more seats, we go back and and start with from scratch basically instead of just manipul or not manipulating. I'm sorry, just editing what we've already had done. I think uh, it brings into a bigger question uh, if we start to add more seats. I don't know if this is it appropriate to get into that kind of detail right now. Or are we just going to talk about reopening it right We're now? Just talking to reopen it. Okay. I mean, I'm generally in favor of the staff position, but uh, if we were to reopen it, I'd like to see some um, details changed. Okay. I, uh, do I have, are there any citizens to comment on this? Well, you'll need a motion and a oh, second. Oh, I'm sorry. Do I have a motion? A motion. Do I have a second? second? All right. I have a motion and a second. Is there any citizens wishing to comment on this one? No, sir. All right. Pulling back to the board. All in favor say aye. 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 All in favor oppose. Right. What? No. <laughs> I know. We have no, I. So one opposed. <laughs> so nine, nine to one. Yep, nine to one. All right. Um, moving on to uh, upcoming events. Do you have any? Do you no, want to talk just, about? Just one for the highlight Okay. On that one, I'd like to just make a comment. Just add to your calendars. Reminder that June we don't have a meeting, so not to show up. And uh, any other comments from board members who are interested in commenting on anything? All right. Not seeing anything. I adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Smith.